Okay. Excuse this uh, brief interlude here. This is going to be episode 119. And you may have noted that the last episode I did was 118, and that was also a Magdenberg Monday. I put the two Think On It um, episodes in between there, and then I had, shall we say, a very interesting week that included two medical procedures, one scheduled, one definitely unscheduled. So I apologize for muddling up last week, but I am back in the saddle. We are moving forward. As I said, this is episode 119 of Mogden During Monday. This is uh, the second of a five series that I'm doing. Uh, now that I've finished this little brief interlude, the episode is as it is. We'll continue momentarily. Thank you. Welcome. This is According to Callis, and that's me. We're going to pick up where we left off. This is Mogdenberg Monday, and this is part two. We're going to begin with the confession and defense of the pastors and other ministers of the Church of Mogdenberg. That'd be the 13th of April in the year 1550. So they start with Psalm 18. I spoke of your testimonies in the sight of kings and was not put to shame. Romans 13. Rulers are for are, are not a terror for good works, but for evil. Acts 9. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goad. Now on to the preface. Now, I want to be clear, this is a challenging read at times because unlike the modern PhDs that I so enjoy reading, um, because they can translate that which has happened and some of the, um, let's call it, flourish writing of the days gone by into common everyday language, whereas this translation tries to stay true to the... Actually, I wouldn't say tries. I think it succeeds in staying true to the flourish in the intent of the writers of the time. And at times can be a bit difficult to read, particularly in light of the difference between the modern day uh, Catholic Church and the modern day Lutheran Church. Uh, But this is clearly written at a time where there's deep animosity. Uh, I would call it even hatred and jealousy between the two and jealousy is maybe not the proper word but clearly when the pope's trying to stamp you out because you don't agree with him on certain things that would only come to mind as jealousy plays a part in that so the preface begins there can be no doubt that god by his great kindness raised up Dr. Martin Luther, as a third Elijah, in order that he might reveal in these last days, according to his published prophecies, the man of sin, the man of, or the son of perdition, the Antichrist ruling in Rome in the temple of God, likewise to destroy him by the spirit and mouth of Christ. That's basically lumping them all together because there's a whole bunch of commas and basically, um, equating the current Pope with being the Antichrist. One of the things that is interesting is there is the kind of a nonspecific generic noun Antichrist and then the kind of the proper noun Antichrist or the Antichrist. So not really sure where we fall on that, um, because basically every generation that I can think of has always thought that the end was almost here. When you look at the grand scope of time, which can be in the human mind, thousands of years, but perhaps significantly longer, depending on how you measure and who's measuring it. But that is but a blink in the eye for the creator God. So again, we carry on. Since God raised Luther up for this exceedingly difficult task, he also equipped him at the same time by the Holy Spirit with a superior understanding of the sacred scriptures. With singular strength of faith in his heart like an immovable rock and the lively skill in his mouth for teaching and arguing. He kindled his mind with the most ardent zeal for the house of God and filled it with the hatred of the Pope and of all impiety. So once again... Not only uh, have we elevated 
Mr. or I should say Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther, we have now put him into a point that he is the appointed vessel from God himself. And he gave him an audience in a great part of the Roman Empire among certain other kingdoms and peoples. And he gloriously defended both his person and the cause right up to the last moment of his life. Okay. Um, again, just trying to equate, uh, I guess a lineage here would be the best way to explain this. Uh, these guys are the true believers uh, lined up behind Martin Luther and they're trying to put Martin Luther to where he is uh, kind of the prophet, right? And we're following him, and we believe he is more accurate. What's interesting is we will see this play out again and again um, in the history of the, well, certainly the Christian world. So this is kind of laying the groundwork that Perhaps there's not a single authority and perhaps there's more than one way to understand things. So that's an interesting thing as an aside, but I digressed and I'm going to go forward just a little bit here. And in, we're going to jump in, especially the supporters in the recent case were still poor and weak while its enemies were very numerous, and powerful, and moreover, they banded together for this purpose that they were not willing to rest before they had Caesar persecuting with his fury and that they were ready to expend their own resources in life to extricate this entire doctrine. That'd be Lutheranism, right? They're, they're trying to destroy it. Well, in, isn't yet been born or matured. For when the theologians had been ordered to write a refutation of the confession produced by a few Lutherans, those men not only did it with difficulty and timidly, but also so clumsily and without the true foundation of the word of God, that once the refutation met the ears of those in the Senate of the empire who were expecting a plain refutation of the heresy alleged by them, it testified greatly to the emptiness of this doctrine. Interesting. So they admitted (laughs) they were not able to defeat the Lutheran religion by the word of God. The church fathers failed, right? So there have been many other similar things done at Augsburg in the convention that took place 20 years ago. And very many people who were there themselves or have read the written account of it. The case of Luther, therefore, has always been victorious from the beginning. Unvanquished by testimonies and arguments from the word of God. The truth is not defeated by arms. Victory by arms is neither able to change anything about the truth, nor does it always accompany the truth. Now, isn't that interesting? So, truth can never be defeated. Now, there's a whole lot of people that believe that from different mm, sides of this issue, right? It is only when we decided that there can be more than one truth, or that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth, did we see them chip away at this. But as long as you believe that there is one truth, it's a question of a quest to get to the truth that you uh, have determined is the truth. And if there can only be one the truth, whatever you determine that to be is what you're going to live your life by. But in today's day and age, we have gone so far as to take that away as well. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. 500 years ago, they saw this coming. The cause of the prophets of Christ and of the apostles first truly began to emerge in oppression, and they themselves, after their death, began to be glorious. For this purpose, God placed his prophets and apostles that they should go forth and bearing the fruit, and their fruit should remain, and that he himself might display his power and weakness in life and death, glory and shame, his planting and their uprooting continues on and so luther although dead both lives forever himself and the fruit of his work 
So again, they're saying we have picked up where Martin Luther has left off and we are confessing to his doctrine and we are backing his doctrine just like he made it in Augsburg. And the German states were at war amongst themselves over this very thing. Um, And we're not going to reject these articles. And we're not going to submit ourselves to the authority of the Antichrist. For those of you who haven't been following along, they are using that as the Pope. Whether I agree with it or not is irrelevant. That is their writing. No further mention should be made of the Augsburg Confession, either in voice or writing. But the memory and appearance of that confession should be effaced by a contrary label and an indifferent appearance. For it to be cursed by some men unto the pleasure of our enemies, the contempt of the gospel. And the, that, although Luther has been the chosen instrument of God for laying bare this gospel against the Antichrist, the churches of the Christ should be subjugated to that very Antichrist. Again, they're saying we have reformed our churches. We have noted the problems. Why would we then go submit ourselves to the guy that we see as being the head of those troubles or the head of those faults. Interesting. Again, irrelevant what I think. This is from the words of the Lutheran ministers. Go a little further forward. Therefore, even if these states and those whom they have consenting in this apostasy have really rejected the Augsburg Confession, and by this rejection or holotry with the Antichrist have made all of Christ, the gospel and the rest of religion, no less useless to themselves than they have the other fornicators of the world who do not repent. (laughs) So basically, um, let me translate. When you compromise on these scriptures, on these confessions, you are basically making them useless, meaningless. Then he continues on. Since our magistrates and the magistrates and the church of the city are among them, to the point that our enemies themselves profess to be assailing the remnants of this confession among us, we judge that it is our part of our duty, since the kindness of God we have seemed to single out from the whole of the church and have a voice that is still free, that we publicly put forth something to vindicate in some way the revealed doctrine of the gospel from this unjust oppression. Basically, our city, our prince, if you will, has said, no, we're going to continue to do this. I'm going to allow this and encourage it. And they're saying, we have our we have our champion, right? We're going to keep doing this. And here we go. So in this writing, first of all, we shall only repeat, not argue, the articles of doctrine made plain by Luther and set forth at Augsburg as Christian, Orthodox, and Catholic, with a small c, insofar as Unconquered, we agree with the doctrine of the apostles and the prophets with the apostles of Nicene and Athenian creeds. And if I butchered that, my apologies. And with the pure churches of all ages. At the same time, we should add that some things along the way, there is some dissent from this timeless consensus of the doctrine by the, again, papists, interminists, and adiaphorists, and likewise the Anabaptists, sacramentarians, and similar fanatics, from all of whom we have distantly withdrawn ourselves. Okay, just as an aside here, and I find this somewhat interesting, so I'm going to take a moment to digress. Um, The Anabaptists, they believe that you would basically do the sprinkle baptism at birth, and then you would do a dunking baptism uh, when they became full believers. Uh, The Anadiaphorists, Um, and the interminists, basically these guys were the ones that were compromising with the Catholic church. They basically said, well, we're going to go along to get along in case that doesn't sound familiar. That's a common problem now. And the sacramentarians, honestly, I haven't looked that up. I could, uh, but for the purpose of this, we're going to just leave it alone. Suffice it to say, they're calling them fanatics. Basically they're focusing on a couple things and just kind of going all in. Later on in the footnotes, I read that one of the reasons why they didn't do an immersion baptism is because they did not want to be aligned with the Baptists, the Lutherans, that is. 
and I'm going to guess that has to do with the Anabaptists doing the full immersion and they were trying to leave a bright line of separation there. Interestingly, I say that because both the Lutherans and the Catholics had no love for the Anabaptists, which is interesting because the Lutherans are going to fight through all of this and in the end they're going to get their independence as such, in Germany at least, And they took it out on the Anabaptists as well. So basically we got ours. We're not going to let you have yours. So they're going to kind of fall to the same problem that they are professing only exists within the Catholic Church under the Pope. Just my digression is over. Uh, my My two thoughts to that, if you will. And secondly, we're going to prove that the preservation of this doctrine is necessary for a godly magistrate and that the dissent of a godly magistrate is just, even against the superior one who is using arms of force to write, uh, or using the arms to force the rightly instituted churches of Christ to dif- or to defect from the acknowledged truth and turn to idolatry. Okay, so that when we get to the second part, that's what it's going to deal with. And that, to me, is one of the most interesting uh, portions. And the idolatry they're directly targeting the catholic church at the time they're well i'm going to leave that alone but the simplest translation is they feel that the way that the catholic church was running they had a lot of idolatry within it and that was one of the things they were seeking to remove from their own faith again As we'll see, nothing's new under the sun. In the third section of this little book, where ye shall warn all the pious of all the churches, both magistrates and subjects, and we shall point out not only how great a crime these men are committing who bring help to our persecutors of this doctrine and of the church against us, but also how those who who fail to aid us are not without fault, and how both of these things in the opposition to us and desertion of us will be dangerous to their bodily health and their eternal salvation. So basically, <laughs> uh, if you don't support us, you're going to hell. I mean, that's that's the quickest way to explain. I know there's a lot more detail and a lot more um, information there. Um, in drawing out these propositions, since we will desire to offer insult to no one, <laughs> we shall even freely... S- Spare us who do harm to us, insofar as the nature of the matters which we speak about allows. So far as the very reason of our task allows us to be spared by sparing them. If anyone still seizes upon anything in this writing, said rather harshly against himself or against others, let him consider only what the subject matter is, and then our calling. We have put the glory of God ahead of the glory of men, just as he had to in his own calling that he had the value of the health of his mortal body less than the eternal salvation of our souls and that the preservation of a few of his own members is dearer to Christ than the entire remaining world of the impious with all its trappings and gifts. So I guess that is the, uh, the end of the intro and, uh, we're going to, um, now jump on to the principal articles of the Christian doctrine. In this kind of an outline, if you will. In order that the whole may be briefer, we shall arrange the entirety of Christian doctrine in seven chapters. One, of God and the distinction of persons. Two, of creation and the cause of sin and the chief kinds of sin. Three, of the law. Four, of the gospel and justification. Five, of the sacraments. Six, of the church and its ministers. And of the power of the church and its ministers. And seven, of polity and economy and the power of each. The reason for the arrangement is the following. First, because all knowledge about God is either knowledge of his nature or of his will disclosed either in the creation or in his revealed word, especially so that the church may have been brought into being by the ministry of the law, the gospel, the sacraments, through men called to his ministry, who, and also because economy and polity ought to be subservient chiefly to the generating of church or at the very least of the civil society of men amongst themselves when they do not attain any other end. So they're wanting you to understand that 
there's a subdivision, right? This is, I guess, this is the beginning. And I know that George Grant, and that would be Dr. George Grant, in case you missed the first episode, kind of spells out that it's through this that we get the division of powers. We get the separation of powers. We get like a federal system. Not created, but spelled out. And it's through this that you get the separation of powers, but also also the spheres of authority, right? We've kind of talked about that. There's the authority of the church, the authority of the state, and the authority of the family. And there's supposed to be some minor overlapping, but largely they're supposed to be separate spheres. It is only when one sphere completely dominates the other two that we get to experience tyranny. Now, that is not the only cause of tyranny, mind you, but that is that is one that is experienced when one is fully dominating the other two in almost every application. So before I jump into the uh, further reading, let me just take a minute. By happenstats of the calendar, today is a Monday, which is also Labor Day. On Labor Day, we're, in theory, celebrating those who labor. And in our modern society, we see that as a good thing. We we like holidays. We like people getting notification or notability or notoriety by things that they have done. In theory, this is supposed to be set aside to recognize that people without notoriety are still deserving of admiration of what it is that they contribute to society. Now, there are those among us who feel that the problem is capitalism. And I will be the first to admit there are problems with capitalism. I I am the first to admit that there is nothing perfect outside of God, right? Capitalism seeks to be the less or the least bad form of doing things. But capitalism is merely an economic function, right? It's it's a worldview based upon the idea that I can have an equal of exchange of a value between two people and where we both feel like we benefited. I'm not sure that we've ever tried capitalism fully or that we fully understand what the full implementation of a capitalistic society might look like. But I can assure you there are plenty of people that are quick to point out that, you know, well, we haven't had real socialism yet or we haven't had real communism yet or North Korea doesn't count because it was run by a dictator. Yeah, okay, that's all well and good. But what I'm suggesting to you is capitalism, at least in theory, when it's coupled with a federalistically designed government, does offer some protections of those spheres of influence, those spheres of power and authority. And it seems to work hand in hand. Nothing will ever end poverty. Nothing will never, or I should say, nothing can ever end poverty poverty. Nothing can ever end uh, injustice, which doesn't mean that we don't strive to do better. We don't strive to improve the situation of the whole, if you will. But I caution you that when we throw out the entirety of a system like the uh, French did, like the Russians did, like the Chinese did, like the North Koreans did, we are kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if you will, or we're jumping out of the pan into the fire. Most every revolutionary really doesn't care about the revolution. They want the power. And I think that's one of the things that's always been missed by those that are right of center, by and large. You know, I'm talking about the the average person is it's always about the power. And when you take somebody that is ostensibly on your team and they get that power, they promptly forget 
what they promised or what they believed because they want to keep that power. We routinely see that with elected officials. We routinely see that with people that are elected to an office or even appointed to an office. They're, they're serving us, but they soon turn into creatures that believe you, we are serving them, that we're at their beck and call. And, and again, this is nothing new under the sun. We see back in the 1500s, a similar uh, philosophy is in place under the uh, princes and the kings. Now, the kings feared their princes and the princes individually feared the king. But they were largely powerless without the populace backing them. If a king wanted to raise an army, he was dependent upon his nobles. He was dependent upon his princes. And the princes were in turn dependent upon their people. So they really couldn't do much of anything without the support from below. It is only with the modern world, courtesy of the, uh, in large part, the uh, French Revolution, but in a lesser extent, the Prussians, that they came up with the idea that we could just basically take the entire populace and mold them into a army that works for the government. And they won't question anything that comes about and they won't understand that there's supposed to be a separation of power in different spheres of authority. They'll work for us, even though we're supposed to serve them. We see that play out right now. So while we're talking about Labor Day, while we're talking about the whole idea of a lesser magistrate, right? The whole idea that Magdenberg laid out that in the defense of their liberty to worship as they saw fit, they were utilizing a doctrine that stated that a magistrate in power can protect his people because that's his job when the person in power above him abuses that power and becomes a tyrant. Now therein lies the rub. Who determines who's a tyrant? Good question. I think that we, the people, get to decide that. Now, in today's day and age, we have this thing called the Constitution. Unfortunately, the last several presidents have not thought very highly of that, including the current resident of Pennsylvania Avenue. If they're not going to follow the rules, if they're not going to obey the highest law of the land, how do they get to keep their job? Why do we tolerate that? What can be done about it? Well, short of starting a civil war, short of going and protesting in D.C., which would largely be meaningless and worthless, we have the state governments. And we do have some influence at the state government. We certainly have influence at the county government. And we need to use our lesser magistrates to interpose themselves between the tyranny that's coming out of D.C. and us, and to a lesser extent, the tyranny that's coming out of Austin and us. Now, I feel confident that with our current county judge and our current county sheriff, we have some measure of protection of that liberty that we cherish. Indeed, one of the things that the Republican Party has got right and done well in the county with is their new slogan, Liberty Lives Here. It's very simple, very easy to understand. Unfortunately, what's going to happen is a lot of people that define themselves as conservatives are going to come face to face with the idea that that liberty isn't only confined to the one or two issues that they care about. It carries on to so many more issues, and they're going to have to respect the liberty of those that disagree with them. And that's going to be a challenge, but I think a good number of these folks are up to it. And I think a good number of these folks are in fact constitutionalists or liberty lovers, if you will, who have come to grips with that and have looked at it in a more mature viewpoint that if I protect my liberty, if I want my liberty, I have to also protect my neighbor's liberty. It's not all. I don't, I don't know if it's a majority, but I'm sure it's a very strong plurality. And as long as I stay involved, I'm confident that we can make it a majority. The reason being is because if you're not going to defend liberty here, you won't be able to defend liberty there. You know, we heard this mantra that we're fighting them over there so we don't have to fight them here. How did that work out for us? 
if you're not willing to defend liberty here, you're not going to be able to defend liberty there. And defending liberty should be the one thing that we can all agree upon. And hopefully the use of our lesser magistrates in light of both Labor Day recognizing those of us that are on the bottom end of society, we're the worker bees, if you will, translates to the lesser magistrates that are above us. And that translates to those higher magistrates above them. And that wards off what would typically be thought of as the highest magistrate. Let them all remember that they're all subservient to the Constitution, which is the highest law of the land. And that in theory, they all gave an oath to uphold it. I've given mine. I hold mine very seriously. And I know there's a lot of veterans out there. We hold it very seriously. As Thomas Jefferson once said that disobedience to tyrants is obedience to God. And it's God singular, not plural, just in case you weren't sure what I said. Disobedience to tyrants is obedience to God. We should all remember that. So when our lesser magistrate steps up and says, eh, not so fast, governor, not so fast, Mr. President, not so fast, Congress. This is what the Constitution says, and this is my role to protect my people. We need to support them. We need to let them know we appreciate that. That's our role as the we in the we the people. We the people need to do that. We need to have their backs. We need to let our lesser magistrates know that we want them to do the right thing and we're going to back them when they do the right thing. That is the lesson (laughs) <laughs> that you can take out of episode two of Magdenberg Monday. This is According to Callus, and I will see you on the other side.